housewives are are drinking Starbucks and and driving Range Rovers when they should be drinking Dunkin' Donuts and driving a minivan. Now, right. I'm not saying that is what every woman should be doing, could or couldn't be doing. I was just saying the expenditure in 2019 was drastically off. Like people were just living way beyond their means, right? Like right. should be in a minivan drinking Dunkin' Donuts, not a Range Rover drinking Starbucks. All right, guys. Today, we have my friend, Frank Capillary. I've actually known him for a couple years now, and I've gotten pretty close to him on several different levels, which has given me the ability to be very intrigued in many things that he does, has done and continues to do. And the the ironic part to this interview is I probably should have asked him to do it at least a year ago. And then recently, a couple of weeks ago or something along those lines, we were in conversation and he was talking about major media appearances, in this case on CNBC and being in front of the, the lights and the cameras and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, Frank, why haven't you been on my podcast yet? And Frank said something along the lines of, well, we've we've never discussed it, which means I never invited him. So I said, all right, let's change that. We should have had you on the show well in advance, but you're here today. I actually get to talk to you two days in a row. Mm -hmm. Today being the second day, we had a great conversation yesterday. And the nuance is we're going to talk about the same topics today too. So joining us from the Westchester area, which isn't too far from me being in the New Haven area, Frank, dude, what's going on, man? Chris, great to be here. Thanks so much. And, you know, as you said, we become good friends and, you know, if I had respect for what you've done for a long time, especially serving our country in the way that you did and now starting the Clark Initiative, which you know, I'm so excited to see what that's going to do. Help so many veterans that they need the help. And, you know, that's you're doing many things, but that is the one that I'm most excited about. And of course, following your own entrepreneurial journey and knowing that you've shared so much of that and the value that you provided, a lot of it free uh, to, your, to your podcast and YouTube listeners. And I think that that shows exactly how you are. You're a giving person. And you turn me on to one of my favorite books, The Go-Giver, as well by Bob Berg and John Mann. And so I think, you know, I've, I've, that has been a huge help to me in the business and the entrepreneurial uh, part of my life that started about a year and a half ago. And you've, I, I've seen you go back and forth with Bob on socials, right? You guys are building a relationship, Bob Berg. He's outstanding. He yeah. lives by his example. Yes. I'm sure so just knowing that you've gotten so many of those people that I've known about and some others that our shared acquaintances, I feel honored to be part of that roster now. So I'm excited about talking to you today. Two decent humans here, and, and Bob is, a, is an excellent human too. And I think it wouldn't be fair to move on past Bob Berg without singing his praises quickly. That man is epic and world-class in every category that I've ever seen him in, speaking, consulting, writing, helping, giving. And um, he's the type of guy that, I'll, I'll tell the story, I'll tell the story. Yeah. After I met him, he's like, what do you mean you sell luxury watches, Chris? And I was like, well, I sell luxury watches, Bob. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, ah, oh, okay, all right. So he he texts me a week or two later, something along these lines. So he texts me later and he says, will you sell my watch? <laughs> and I said, yeah, of course, Bob. And he's like, but under one context. And I said, yeah, sure. What's that? He goes, do not give me a special break. Charge me full price to sell it. Amazing. I've never heard that in my career before. Never. I've never heard that. And uh, it drills home the point that you said that he lives and breathes what he teaches, right? So Bob is an, is an amazing human. And I've seen you guys go back and forth on LinkedIn, I believe. So, Well, that's uh, another part of it, as I didn't even anticipate him replying. Mm -hmm. I mentioned, the, you know, I think you mentioned something about the book. And I said how I was so appreciative of you introducing me to it and how 
he became an instant favorite. He was immediately, thank you so much, Frank. I can't thank you enough. Like one person out of probably millions that said that to him. So that again shows exactly what type of person he is. Yeah. Super, super humble, super humble. Yeah. So if uh, Mr. Berg is listening, what's going on, Bob? We miss you. Um, Bob has been on the show and so on and so forth. But uh, so the today is about you, though, buddy. And, um, you know, our, my goal here today is to really to get you to be able to talk about what you have done and what you're doing. I think what you're doing is very intriguing to, to me, but also to, to anyone else who wants to understand markets specifically, and I think properly said, financial markets. So I want to know about a lot, but let's start with who you are as a man. I know you have a son, you're married, you've been married for a while. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. And so my son just turned 15 high school playing basketball and he's working hard you know he's a good student so i'm very blessed to have him and of course uh, my wife kimberly we met in college and you know the rest is history so to speak and so it's been a great ride and i, I, I say that you, you don't never know when you go to college where you're going to find and so i was very fortunate to have found her and you know we've been living it in New York City first, and then Westchester. And, you know, it's an area where around where, where she grew up, and I've, you know, been welcomed arms by uh, her, her family. And the people over here are, you know, the, the, the uh, very supportive family and friends that we have. And so it's unfortunate to be here. And being so close to New York City as well has been one of the biggest selling points because for about 25 years, I commuted into Midtown, working on Wall Street and different banks. And and so the big change in 2022 is that I left the Wall Street job, or the, I should say Wall Street, quote unquote, um, you know, environment to start my own firm. And so uh, the firm now is called Cap Thesis. And so sometimes people ask me about what that the name means. And so Cap is for capillary, my last name, because let's be honest, no one wants to spell capillary out with all those vowels and consonants. <laughs> um, and thesis is really twofold. Uh, one being that I ended up majoring in English in college, even though I always wanted to be in the financial environment. And one of the reasons was because I guess I'm pretty good at writing, right? One of the teachers, the professors noticed it and it made me think about changing. But really what got me interested about it was I realized that if you could able to be able to support any thought that you had with evidence, right? Prove your thesis, you'd be able to get a good grade, number one. But then broadly speaking, as I was going through that process, realizing that if you're able to communicate properly, whether it's writing, speaking, presentations, that's going to help you no matter what your career choice is. And obviously that's proven correct because I spent most of my life writing and talking about the markets, not just trading in them. And so again, so the other part of, of thesis is just that, right? Just it's, I'm really, when I talk about a stock idea or the market, it's not just a hunch. You see plenty of those out there, not just what I think, it's the reasons behind what's going in there. And that's really what my clients through the years have appreciated because a lot of the times you can get so many different opinions, so many brokerage firms and everyone has a strategist or research analyst, but they really do want to know is why, right? They want to know what pieces am I missing? What are you thinking about? Because with that, the best, more successful portfolio managers are very good at taking basically the mosaic, every a lot of moving parts together, putting them into something, coming up with their own investment thesis and obviously doing well from that point. And so Cap Thesis is, as you might imagine, independent research firm specializing in technical analysis. And technical analysis is different than the traditional fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis first is analyzing a company, right? The their balance sheet income statement, financial statements, the products, the services, what the company does. And you put all that together with the math, you come up with an estimate of what you think the price should be based on how the company does. Oftentimes, though, a company and its stock do not act similar. I would give the last four months as an example where- but We're most talking about public companies. Exactly. Publicly traded stocks. Didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's that's a very good uh, clarification to, to give the, the viewers and listeners. And so a lot of times the stock won't act like a company. So again, last four months, we've been paying attention. Stock market has been higher. Most stocks are up a lot. Some of them are good companies that have reported good earnings. Some of them have not. They just went along for the ride. You have the reverse of that as well in 2022, where the best companies just 
started to to decline considerably because you had a better market. So the, to the point being is that oftentimes we can identify opportunities within the market, just looking at the stocks. And I'm looking at stocks based on their trends, their chart patterns. And technical analysis really is just a, a graphical representation of supply and demand. And so supply and demand, everyone knows about that. You know, when prices rise, you know, everyone knows about inflation because there's more people buying and selling. And if you were to chart any one of those, it comes up with patterns. And that's very interesting because it's all about human psychology. You know, I've heard terms of greed and fear. Greed pushes things higher and people get excited about it to the point where it's so high sometimes there's nothing left. So that's when things start to turn around sometimes. So as of right now, a lot of people think we're in the greed phase, possibly extreme greed phases because of how far we've come from the lows, even in October 2022. And the opposite, when in October 2022, there was a lot of fear. You know, there was also a lot of fear in March 2020, right? In those first few weeks of COVID, that's when things started to turn. And so within that like, framework, there are a lot of opportunities to identify by chart patterns, by trends that you sometimes don't see reflected in the company's earnings reports on the way. And so, you know, the best clients I work with, which are, you know, hedge funds, financial institutions, but now also financial advisors and, and active investors, individual investors with an interest in the market as well. I try to, to complement their own analysis by identifying those spots. And you can really increase your trading acumen, if you will, by utilizing technical analysis the right way. The problem most people have is just don't have enough time. So I spend a lot of time identifying these patterns through ETFs, through you know individual stocks, and you know present them in a way that they can understand. And you know, kind of piggyback of the English and, and communication a part of it is that one of the things I really think is important is to present things in a very clear manner, very organized manner, because you know it's about catching eyeballs. Now, a lot of your people listening to this are probably entrepreneurs know what I'm talking about. You want to get attention. And so if you're doing that from a communication email standpoint, number one thing is the subject. It has to be catchy. You want someone to open the email first, right? And then from there, what are the chances someone's going to read all the words? Very low. So the next thing I try to do at least is make sure the charts that I show there, the pictures or people are going to see first. I know most people open my email are just scrolling down, see if they can find something that looks cool, looks different. So I make sure a lot of colors and make sure things are not too messy, so forth and so on. And then it's making sure that you have bold, things jump out, italicized. And then after all that, you have to make sure that the small amount of people that read everything, that you're they're reading something that flows. And so all that together is where I've been... In, doing, you know, again, for many years, but now more so have my my own twist on it. And that's been the most um, the most exhilarating part of this whole journey that I get to create my own culture here. And I know, Chris, you and I talked about it a lot. It's a very important part of it. Uh, yes, very well said. So much to unpack. Let's start from generally speaking, the beginning. So when you did you get out of high school and, and go to college for English? Like, was that the move right there? No, no. <laughs> not at all. Majored in accounting and ah. hated it every second of it. But I thought that was going to be the springboard to finance. And as we know, that was probably one of the first things that, that I realized that you had to like readjust your thinking of what, you know, you have a goal in mind, but there are many different ways to get there. So yeah. that was a big switch. It was a big switch because I didn't even major in finance. You know, I had minored in economics uh, there, but you know, explained to my my family, my friends, and anyone else, like, what are you doing? Not many people would do that and have a springboard into you know getting into onto Wall Street anyway. Okay, did you end up in English? Is that how it worked? Well, I was taking Eng English mandatory class uh, freshman year and. I'll tell you the full story. So I remember doing it and I was just so stressed about accounting uh, along the way. And I just wrote a paper and didn't really think about it because I was on to the next thing. And the professor was passing out the grades and she asked me to stay behind and just talk about something. I just thought that it was, I didn't do what I was supposed to do or something like that. I mean, I was a good student, but I didn't think, didn't register what she wanted to talk about. And she said, well, you know, I gave you an A plus in this paper. Well, that's great. Oh, well, thank you. And she's like, you know, I haven't given out an A plus on a on a paper like this in 10 years. How like, really? She's like, you should really think about it. Like the way you write, it's organized. I forget exactly what she said, but she's like, you have, I want to say a gift, but you have a way of looking at things and expressing yourself that you shouldn't 
ignore. And if you're thinking about, you know, it's very early on in your college career, you may think about doing this because I think you can get even better at it. And so I blew that off at first, but after a while, I realized and after, um, you know, going through a semester, or I guess the first year, I decided to make the change. And it was great because the same thing is I was able to do a lot of reading, but more so the papers, even though it was a lot more work writing all of those, I felt that it, I was able to express myself. And I realized again, as I was doing that, that I could take that and go into something else. I never anticipated, you know, being a writer in terms of writing books, even though that's always a goal as well as a journalist or anything like that. But I did think all along the way that eventually I would get into you know, writing that would help in communicating, whether it's just a clear email or a presentation, that anything that I would eventually do, this was a wonderful base to start from. That's wild that the yeah. professor kind of planted that seed. So you end up switching majors, right? You majored in English. Is What happened? You just ended up on Wall Street? Like, what's the jump here? It's like, <laughs> I'm not computing in my head. Like, yeah, I'm going to exactly. go to school. I think I'm going to do finance. I end up doing English. Now I'm working on Wall Street. Right. Well, two things. Number one, my aunt, who I'm very close with, was on Wall Street for years. And okay. so she invited me into the office when I was young a few times. And she was on the buy side, so to speak. So she was a client of the Wall Street banks. So that means she was given a lot of cool tickets to good events. So going to like some Knicks playoff games on her broker's first dime because she was the guest and you know, her brother and sister and I were her guests. I thought that was cool. But at the same time, it got me interested um, in looking at the market. Like she had it gifted me just a few shares of Exxon way a long time ago. And I was just, it, it caused me to, to continue to follow the stock all along the way. And then, you know, a small amount, but it got my interest. And again, back then, nowhere close to the internet, right? Talking about late 80s to early 90s. And so that was the bug. And so then that was another reason why I felt so conflicted about possibly changing majors. Like, does this mean that I can't possibly get a job uh, in, a, in the financial industry if I don't have a degree like that? But you know, there were a number of things that that said otherwise. And so my, the, the school I went to was up uh, near Albany, New York. And so I was able to intern there and I got an internship in the, in Europe, in Manhattan for two summers as well in at Bear Stearns, which is no longer, and which is now part of JP Morgan. And so just being a part of all that, which is cool about it, I was able to, to work on the trading desk, but also what got me really interested is that we had the ability to sit down with the research analysts. And what struck me about that is we go up and have a lunch with them. Number one, like gourmet lunch, you know, someone who's 20 years old, thought this was outstanding. And then, but basically sitting around a table, one analyst answering every single question perfectly that anyone asked about any company that they covered. I was just blown away that how do they know every single part of this, whether it's a product, whether it's a part of the financial statement, and there is the experts eating like everyone else. And so in my mind, I was like, that's think of what, what I want to do is be the expert, be the expert. And then I know that I'm getting this training writing, I can do it, you know, eventually. And and so that's where I went into. And then by the time I graduated, I was back at a different Wall Street firm interviewing in a resource department and the two different offers, picked the one that was technical analysis related, had no idea what it was. And so, you know, from there, we can go year by year, but it's probably going to take too long. So what's it, what's it like? Like, what's it like working on Wall Street? Like, paint the picture. Well, I would say it's very different depending on where you're at. So mm -hmm. I went from being in, research originally so relatively quiet what you would think right you just you, you do your work you talk to some of the clients help out the senior analysts but i wouldn't say it was boisterous now that changed three years in when i switched jobs and worked on top right at a desk and i got there one week before the internet bubble burst right so and the way down so it was march 2020 i'm sorry march 2000 99 yeah 99 to 2000 that's yeah, right exactly so mm -hmm. the first few months of 2000 was a continuation of 99, 1999, straight up. So when the first real hiccup happened in March, no one believed it was the end. Yeah. No one believed it was the end for another year. Yeah. And so that was insane because it was as loud as you expect, what you see in the movies and you know things broke a lot just because of the way of how fast things were trading. And so at the time I was still, still doing, so I was doing a lot of research still, but there was a lot of stuff going on around me. But soon after that, actually, I did move into trading. So I was in trading for 16 years, doing a lot of writing on the, on the side. But the, my main my main role was uh, talking to buy side traders. So buy traders at 
hedge funds, traders at asset managers. And so let me tell you, that was crazy, but even more insane was going through, sitting on a desk, being a trader during the great financial crisis, because it was, I would say there was a, a three-prong effect there because I was watching my personal account go down like everyone else, worried about my own clients because a lot of them, you know, would go out of business potentially if things continued the way it was. But the biggest thing, which was even scarier, was that predators, meaning big brokerage firms, were going into business overnight. And so literally walking in the next morning, thinking, I'm going broke, my account's going down. You might not have blowing it. up. They can't pay us anymore. You and then that. now the firm might, have, might be around again. So that was, a, I remember talking to someone recently. I remember that was the first time I went into work scared, heart wow. beating, because they had no control of any of that. Right. Now, I 99, I was a freshman in high school, right? So like my conceptual idea of this was like MTV. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. No, no, no one really know. I, we That was our, that was what we were watching. So, you know, that's how we were getting our news, if you will. But um what was it like? Like, how heavy did it affect the financial market and Wall Street and so on and so forth? The internet bubble? Yeah. Well, that was interesting because that wasn't really the first time you heard about day trading. Mm -hmm. And I remember like talking to people, relatives, friends that were not involved with the market at all, seeing they made so much money and they were quitting their jobs and doing this. And, you know, I had heard about bubbles before, but not really. But thinking back, of course, hindsight is 2020. But when you see those types of signs, of things. We start hearing about people talk about the market that don't really talk about it much. That's when you, you think that things are changing. And I would relate it back to crypto, right? 2017, which was another time when they talk about going to the water cooler and hearing the chatter. I remember talking to these people I didn't even think paid attention to like, you know, assistance or what have you, asking if I opened up a Coinbase account, yeah, which crypto am I buying? I was like, this is wild. Right. And so of course after that things fall apart. So Back then, it was the same type of thing where we know that number of, of a handful of stocks made it through that, number one being Amazon, but there are thousands that did not. And some of them had some wild rides, but it, very few people that bought those back then were able to sell them at the top. And so the people that, and again, I can, I'm not going to generalize everyone, but in, in terms of what happened, a lot of people that shouldn't have quit their jobs went from making a lot of money to losing most of it just because it was just a time that a true bubble happened. And so, you know, coming back to right now, you may sometimes people are talking about, it appears like right now, it looks like 1999 uh, in some respects. I would disagree with that because that was going on for four or five years back then. You may recall this one story, which is interesting, I think, for people is that Alan Greenspan was the, the Fed chair back then. And so, he even stated during the time when the, the bubble was happening, famous quote was that it's a rational, there's a it's a rational exuberance right now. So he was right. However, he said that in 1996. So he was three years early with that, right? And so I think right now, I still think the market is a little bit overextended here in you know February 2024. But if you look back to some of the rallies of what went on during those four years of craziness, I don't believe we're at that stage right now. There was uh, I think it was 2019, 2019, I put out a, a podcast and I was really concerned about the economy, right? I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I do and I don't, you know, and I was, I remember I, it's still live. Like I've never taken down a show, but I was talking about like housewives are, are drinking Starbucks and, and driving Range Rovers when they should be drinking Dunkin' Donuts and driving a minivan. Now, right. I'm not saying that is what every woman should be doing, could or couldn't be doing. I was just saying the expenditure in 2019 was drastically off. Like people were just living way beyond their means, right? Like right. should be in a minivan drinking Dunkin' Donuts, not a Range Rover drinking Starbucks. Like for, you know, normal middle-class America and people were buying these larger houses than they could afford unless they liked being mortgage broke. And I could see it like written on the wall. And this was Q4. I was talking about it. So I was very late. I sensed it. And also when, you know, when the 
federal government is run in a certain manner back in 2019, you know, by a high level businessman and his cabinet, of course, things are going to be interesting, you know, and like, I don't know what was happening with the S&P 500 at that point. And I, I wasn't in crypto, but I was understanding the small business game and like customer buying patterns and things were just wrong. I had school teachers spending a thousand dollars a month on personal training. And I was like, this doesn't compute. How can you spend 30% of your monthly income on personal training? Like, I don't mm. get it. This doesn't make sense. Uh, so I understand to a degree. And I think a lot of people listening to that might not remember or <laughs> were around for the dot-com bubble, I can see the polarities between 2020 and 2000, right? Yes. Uh, now, Frank, in your professional opinion, is are those basically two business cycles in between that, uh, that time frame? Yes. And I would say it's interesting because if you look at, for instance, the S&P 500 just hit 5,000 for the first time. And since when, like back, 2021? Excuse me? Well, since, well, has it been there ever or? No. It's, it's never been. been. The first time it hit it. Yeah. New this is the highest it's been. Yes. Okay. Highest it's been. Okay. And so that always brings a lot of emotion with it. And so going back to that time frame, the first time it hit 1,000 was in February 1998, okay. where it didn't clear 1,000 for good until late 2009, mm. right? So after everything started coming back. So you're talking about 11 years. Wow. So think about this. If we're right in the same spot we are now 11 years from now, you know it's not going to be a flat line. It's going to be a wild rot, right? And so in between that time frame, if you recall, all those internet bubbles, stocks, a lot of them went bye-bye. But then what happened was a lot of that greed went into real estate, right? And which is then what caused all these different derivatives to develop. And talk about greed, Wall Street just created a, a spot for people to leverage that to the nth degree. Just and, a different asset class. Excuse me? It's just a different asset class. Different asset class, but this exactly, but the same type of mentality. Right. Well, greed there. And you know, the the book and movie Big Short does a good, very good job of describing what happened there. And so everyone was asking about when the great financial crisis occurred, like, what's going on? Like, but a stock do something? It's like, no, it's the derivative of the bonds. And like people didn't understand exactly what was going on because if, unless you're really involved in it, it's very intricate. But then that just shows how there was unraveling. And so it was, it was technology stocks and dot-com bubble and it was financial stocks doing the major majority of the damage in the great financial crisis. So you had, you had basically had two of those in a very short period of time and then just correcting it all the way from that point where every time someone brings up a point about comparing this to the great financial crisis, the banks have been completely revitalized, especially the bigger ones, to help prepare for a liquidity crisis like that. Now, there are, of course, other things to worry about. But the point being is, Chris, you made a good point about it. There's always something, right? There's a business cycle that comes back. And a lot of times in the market, too, there's new leaders develop. And when there's a new trend, you know, there's going to be some antics around it, like AI right now. Only thing you hear about is AI. And and so there's going to be some companies that do well with it, some that just put it in their their title or their their name and want to ride the wave. And eventually, you know, this will be something, but like the internet was, but it's not going to be everything right away. So I think that's probably in terms of a bubble. I think it's going to be something that we have to pay attention to. And it's going to it's going to help automate things. But there was a gentleman I saw an interview yesterday saying that you know, people think it's going to replicate the human mind, which it is not, thankfully, right? And so, but that could be factored into some of these estimates of some of these stocks. Slight variation here, and we don't have to go down this road, but did you see the interview with uh, Carlson and Putin? Oh, not yet. Yeah, it's a good so one though, right? Tucker Carlson interviewed Vladimir Putin, right? The president of Russia, which is crazy. Most people don't know, not only is that guy a badass, he's a black belt in judo and he could like kill you at 70 years old physically, but he's also one of the richest men living in the world. He's just not on the public charts, right? Completely controls our global economy mm. in many different manners. And that's why he got along with Trump because they got along in business. But that's not the, the point that we're getting at is uh, he commented on Elon. There's Putin, and I'm paraphrasing, said that Elon has already put a Neuralink chip into his mind 
like Putin is saying that it's already done. So you have AI, you have now our brains are going to go crazy because of these chips and it's going to start happening. And how is that going to affect the business world? And S&P 500 is 5,000, $300,000 homes are now $650,000 homes. And there's so many different avenues we can go down here. But I think what is most important is that you're giving us a really good overview of, you know, what you are a pro in and have been doing for 27 years, is it? 27 years. Who's counting? 27 <laughs> years. <right? laughs> and uh, all right. So let's let's get back to Wall Street. Let's reel it back in for a second. So 2007, 2008 comes around after that correction from the dot com. What happened? Did it screw up Wall Street? Were people jumping out of buildings? Yes. They, they were. And it was the timing was interesting though, because initially, again, a lot of these banks went under, but there had there were a lot of mergers. And so when yeah. you have mergers and, and banks being taken over, there's a lot of a lot of work needs to be done to integrate all that. Right. And so for the longest time, when you create all integrate all those systems, it just takes time to to service clients. And a lot from a from a client perspective, hedge funds and other asset managers like that, you didn't see it right away, but over the next two years. I think the number of hedge funds got cut in half at that point and then started to get built back up. But kind of like you heard the term Magnificent Seven, the big, the biggest seven stocks in the S&P 500, all technology, huge, right? And so some of the financial uh, firms that run a lot of money, it's like the big became bigger and the smaller ones just start to struggle. You know, for a while, uh, my old firm, we had a, a team that was specifically for new account sales to go out and there's this hedge fund opening up every week or so, sign them up, get them on the training system. They really didn't have that for a while because again, there were so many firms going under. It, it had a, to challenge a lot of pensions and endowments that would, would typically use hedge funds as a sort of alternative investment vehicle to gain trust again for that. And now let's say it's back and people understand what's going on more, right? And so if I look at, if I'm a big, you know, running a pension or endowment, so in billions of dollars, you're not, you're not picking stocks at that point, right? You're just allocating capital. And the big decision every year is how much do I put in large cap stocks? How much do I put in, you know, whether it's fixed income, commodities, alternative investments, it's real estate, or even hedge funds. And then with hedge funds too, I think they get, they get a bad rap sometimes as being these cowboys high flying, but really it's a way of diversifying one's capital, again, from a much larger scale, because every hedge fund had its own strategy. Like right? you have someone long short fund that just tries to buy stocks that are going up and short that are going down. They could do anything. That's just one particular essay or this one particular strategy. Other ones are just focusing on, you know, deal making in technology names. And we know that that's not going to give you a huge return, but they're trying to to give you that part of your portfolio where you maybe 5% every year is going to give you what you want from that part of it, just as an example. And so you know, right now, again, people are trying to understand like the, the larger cap names, big technology stocks in the USA have outperformed, Europe have outperformed many other countries and also outperformed the smaller names. So the, the big question is, is that ever going to change? Or conversely, if a stock like Apple, Amazon, Meta, all of them start to eventually come back down again, Will that take down the entire market, or will we have some capital flowing into other areas? We have that rotation that you sometimes hear about on the news, and I think that's that's again. I think that's going to be very interesting because the last few days, some of the airs come out of those bigger names and the smaller stocks, just to say, and some of the smaller stocks have been able to support it. One of the things to consider, though, is that you have the Russell 2000, which is all many of the, the smaller cap names that, as an index. Is the same capitalization or is it less than Apple right now? But one stock bigger than 2,000 names together. So wow. that's, that's always a, I would say, a conversation that breeds contention because a lot of people think that it can't be sustained. Anyway, it's always something to talk about, argue over, but that's why we do at Cap Thesis try to eliminate those arguments. Be like, there's a pattern that looks bullish. Let's identify that. Don't worry what the name is. If you want it to you know, get a trade out of it, we know how these, you know, the probability of this happening is, and you know, here's the target, here's where we're wrong, which is called a stop loss, and it eliminates the noise. And that's really the, the crux of what I've been doing for years. And I'm going to get into cap thesis and the services and products that you have here in a second, but I want to 
Before we get there, I want to try to understand the work hours and load, you know, post the Great Reset or what one's it? Wait, what's the terminology for what's the time frame on Great Reset? What year? Well, I suppose it depends on <laughs> which one we're looking at. You know, I, I, would, I was going to say, I might be saying it wrong, but 2008 wasn't the Great Reset, was it? Well, that's when I think that's probably the line in the sand to use because that was a metamorphosis, a huge change. Okay. And so basically March 2009 was a low from that period. Okay. So 2010 to 2020, what was your workload like? Like how many hours were you working? Like what did a day look like? Well, from there... I was, my main line of work was, was trading. Mm -hmm. And so, but when, I should say this, I got hired originally still doing technical analysis research, you know, as a, as a younger analyst, there was opportunity at that point, a few years later to go on the desk. So at that point you get accounts. So that's typically a springboard that helps, you know, you know, build, you want to get in front of clients that way. And so that was great because I was able to talk to a lot more of my counterparts on, on buy side desks. And so not that I put the content to the side, but my focus was growing those accounts for a number of years. And so when 2000, when the great financial crisis happened, again, things changed. There weren't, the money wasn't, there wasn't a lot to go around commission wise. So you had to, to differentiate yourself a lot. So that's when I started to, to write commentary again and more so. And so I started doing that just for my own clients. And then eventually people got wind of it. They it Others wanted to hear about it as well. And so the person, the gentleman that hired me, one a great mentor, has one of the best fields in the market as I've come across. Eventually left in 2014. So what I did at that point was I took what I was doing and then basically gave it to everyone in the firm, reached out to members of the press as well, and tried to really spread the brand as much as I could back then as well. And so a lot of it from that point, from 2014, all the way to 19, I was doing both, was writing more, covering accounts at the same time. So that workload was overwhelming to the point where I was really had some pride about one, what I wanted to do and wanted to do it the right way. And so if I did a lot more of the commentary and did some you know, interviews on TV back then, just a few, but it was always about, I always felt guilty because I had to have my my colleagues covered my accounts while I was gone and I felt like I was doing something selfish for myself, right? And so I made the decision back then in 2019, it was a tough one, to leave trading altogether and to focus directly on content. So that was the first parachute to leave behind because it's easy to get paid, so to speak, when you have a revenue behind you in terms of trading volume and commissions that way. That's easily tracked. What's not easily tracked on Wall Street sometimes is the content that you give is really adding to the client relationship. And so I, I tried for a while to, to make that work, running, you know, try to run a business inside of a business. I, I knew that it was going to be a short-term thing just because of the way the nature was, but it got me, I was very fortunate to have given the opportunity to talk to clients from that angle and talk to them about what they wanted to see and possibly what, you know, right price point would be. So I spent, again, two or three years doing that. And that's when I made a decision uh, to eventually leave and, and do that in the capacity where I'm doing it now. And were these all day, like 12 hours in Manhattan type stuff? I would typically arrive by getting the office by seven and then leave by six. And again, that was before we had the work at home part of it. And then I would do hours. some things at home. And, you know, yeah, I, I would say that. And, you know, on the training desk is different as well. There's a lot of activity back and forth. And, and so post COVID, you know, I stayed home a lot. And I still was going into the office as well. But then as I started, you know, you start doing one thing, it just snowballs. And I had, I spent a lot of time creating systems, creating different things that I wanted to make sure that our clients got because I, I knew it would be helpful. And I was always in the back of my mind too, Chris, thinking that I wanted to be able to share this with the retail investor, the financial advisor as well, that doesn't always have access to Wall Street Research, actually don't at all, unless you see it on TV. And so one of my goals then was Again, continue to serve my institutional clients from an independent platform, but bring that that research, those notes, that knowledge to people who have had an active interest in the market, to financial advisors at a you know reasonable price as well with different tiers that we offer at Cap Thesis. And that's been very rewarding to get to meet people along the way that I wouldn't have otherwise. And that's the good thing about social media, being active on X and most recently or and LinkedIn, but most, more recently on YouTube, 
I met a lot of really good people along the way that value the information the correct way and, you know, being able to grow with them and teach them along the way and just add to their potential, you know, financial success has been a great experience. So, okay. All right. So let's get into this. So you're, you're 2022 was when you decided to put Wall Street behind you after 25 years, if I'm not mistaken? That's correct. Okay. And so after 25 years, you're like, all right, you know what? We're going to do this on our own. And you decide to open cap thesis and you're going to really put a dent in the education of the financial markets for two specific types of customers, if I'm not mistaken. Your your, um, enthusiast who's needs to understand what's going on, maybe the market, the SP 500, different stocks and options, and then your larger uh, companies, i.e. maybe hedge funds. Yes. But you're advising both large hedge funds and maybe like a casual user like myself who wants to trade. That's right. That's right. And so go ahead, please. Right. And so the, the good thing is that the information how it's presented is the same. And the difference, of course, is being able to work more closely and the, the bigger clients having access doing bespoke work or, or work that now they need to see for their for their business, having meetings and so forth, where working with the uh, you know, retail financial advisory still get access to all, you know, most of the same, not all, but most of the of the same information, but all of it is terminology, the patterns, the stocks that I look at and recommend. I think that's it, there's a differentiator as well compared to sometimes you'll see there's plenty of services out there, stock picking services, plenty of people that they have private X or Twitter fees that you know I have real time alerts on stocks and, and all that. I'm not about that. I, I do provide ideas, but again, I'm really cognizant of the fact that it has to be well thought out. And people have to understand what's behind it. And it's not just about being there and firing off different things because of something moves by a tick. Not at all. In fact, most of the analysis that I do and write about, I do off hours. Like I'm doing, working on the business and in the business during the day, but I'm not looking at something saying, oh, there's a, there's a stock breaking out intraday. Everyone should know about this. No, right? It's, it's, it's more about, okay, if I see stock ABC making you move and it's part of, maybe it's a biotech name, let's, let's look, are there more biotech names doing this and why? And if that's the case, then maybe it's time to look at a biotech ETF and talk about that from a bigger perspective because it was down for so long. If it's making a comeback, that could tell us that not only healthcare is doing better, but there is interest in speculative growth area, speculative growth, then it goes further than this biotech. Maybe this time now, speculative growth areas start to outperform large cap growth. And if that's the case, then we have to make a shift altogether. So that type of thing where... We can just talk about one stock and say that, but I think it's more important to frame it in that sense to people understand the bigger picture, what could be really happening underneath the surface. Your research and experience allows you to observe trends and patterns, for lack of better terms, and the experience allows you to be able to regurgitate likely what's going to happen from these different trends and patterns. And you take that information and you package it up and you deliver it to clients that need your expertise and articulation on what is happening. Does that sound about right? Yes. Can I use this? Can I use that as a promo on my website, Chris? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) rip it right off, like rip it right (laughs) out of the audio, throw it up there on your website. You're going to be like, who's this bald guy? He doesn't know what he's talking (laughs) about. He probably stole that information from somewhere. Right. But that's that's a very good way of putting it. And I, I think the people that have done this for a long time know that nothing is a guarantee. Right. And one of the, you know, one of, the, of someone I consider someone very high up in the industry, his name is Peter Brandt, who's been a trader in the markets for over five decades. Right. He uses the same type of patterns that I use. Or I should say I use the same type of patterns as he uses. Yeah, 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 for sure. But, but the way he phrases things is that using chart patterns like this isn't necessarily 
going to give you a great amount of success. But what it does is it gives you a spot or something to look at as a reason to get in or get out. And so I think in terms of trading, meaning that you always have to identify, you know, where a good spot to buy is or short for that matter, where you think it could go. Most importantly, though, is where you're wrong. Because again, this is just short term trading, or say over a few days to a few weeks, because you can do anything if you understand what your risk is. And so with that, you can be wrong, say half the time, but if you keep those losses small based on risk and removing ego, that means you can keep those smaller and then be able to leverage the moves to actually go in your favor. And that's really with any system. And there's plenty of, of stories out there about successful traders. And you talk about, they're more willing to talk about why and paying attention to their rules, right? Whatever your rule is, don't veer from it. Chris, I know you're a very systemized person, and that's why you know much of your success comes from understanding what those correct systems are. I mean, how annoyed do you get at yourself if you veer from that it's on a day-to-day -day basis? Error. Right? It's trial and error to get to what I have in place, and that's right. I don't veer from it now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's that's exactly the point. So, so with that, you know, recommending things and always knowing where you're wrong. You know, why, why you're wrong, where you're wrong. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Why? It's just the market telling you. That's one of the things. If you go on to the website, you'll see the core values there. And the number one core value is the market is always right. And that goes with life as well. And we talked about this in the past where going into business, I have thought it would go one way. Sometimes I went the other. Guess what? The market is telling me that's right or wrong. And so stock market related, same thing, which I, which I, another reason why I find the market so exhilarating is because it really is a reflection of human psychology. It really is. And you see that in play with the patterns, but sometimes when you think a pattern is going one way and it goes the other, sometimes that move in the opposite direction is more powerful than the one you anticipated. You have to recognize that. If you have ego involved, you think the market is wrong and continue to fight it, which a lot of people do, that's how you can really get into trouble. Yeah, uh, I'll take your word on that, buddy. <laughs> you know, uh, okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. Um, on your retail side of cap thesis, right? Who exactly is that person that could should come learn from you? Like, what what is their job? What are they trying to do? What industry are they in? Break it down. Like, what what? How do you service that that end of your business? It's a good question. I'll start with saying what the client is not. Right, a yeah. long-term investor who does not care about trading at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and that's fine. That's the majority of the people. And I would say to anyone in that category, you know, if you're a long-term investor, you shouldn't worry about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Where you should just be market agnostic and continue to, you know, dollar cost average along the way. Now, that's easier said than done, but just because of the fear and greed. So, if you think about how the S and P is up X amount in the last, say, thirty years, the average buying and holding investor is not doing that well. Because on the big down day or the big bear markets, everyone gets scared and pulls out, doesn't want to see their money go down anymore. And by the time they get back in, the market is already up 30 or 40%, still off the high. Those are the major parts that, that people miss. So that's like a, basically a personal finance tip there. And again, you have to know your time horizon, know your risk. But if you're talking about anywhere from 10 years out or more, exactly what you should be doing. Don't worry about what people say about overextended too much you know, on the downside, that's a way to play it. Now, there are other people that just are intrigued by the markets and think they can do better than and have proven that they can and want to learn as much as they can about advantages of getting there. And that's where I service people. And I've talked to individual investors worth you know, tens of millions of dollars over the last you know, few, few years and, and some not even close to that, just getting started, understanding they want some education, they want some ideas. And a lot of times they'll look at what I do and use it as a piece of their own investment theory or what they're what they want to do. Again, a lot of people will have one strategy. Some of them are strictly ones that look at fundamental analysis as we talked about before, but understand they want to be able to add to that by using technicals and getting it, you know, for me, biased of course, but doing it for almost 30 years, I know what is worth showing and how to show it. And I think that's the most important thing is conveying it in the correct way and understanding it. And sometimes too, like I've started to do a lot more individual you know, stock ideas on a consistent basis. And I always frame that with, this is how I would trade it. This is how, the levels that I'm paying attention to and why, but you should pay attention to what you want to do as well. You're based on what you, what you already own, 
based on how, what your strategy is, you may want to be more aggressive or not. But it, again, it, it gives them an indication why I'm thinking it. And it could may, maybe push them toward another trade that looks like it in a different industry. You know what I mean? So I think it's all about unearthing ideas and conversation that I otherwise wouldn't have. For sure. For sure. Well said. Um, okay. And on the business aspects, the the hedge funds, you know, is there a way to explain what best style of hedge fund you work with? Is I don't know how to say it. Well, yeah, that's a good way of saying it because as we we talked about before, there are many different strategies. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, it's funny that hedge funds don't want to relay how you're helping them, just knowing that you are, right? Mm -hmm. Just because there's you know there's some secrecy there, and I'm not going to pry. And other part of it too is that. They're doing so many other things, you know, other using brokerage firms for different things. And I think the 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 best way to use what I have, again, is just taking my piece, putting it into their puzzle, making that puzzle better suited to take advantage of the market. Yep. And that is that primarily endowments? Well, endowments could be invested in Psy hedge funds. You know, I, I I've talked to, you know, some big money managers that are, that are not you know, hedge funds as well. And a lot of times too, it's working with their trading desk where you have a big asset manager managing, you know, billions of dollars or more. That means they have a very big desk of say five to 10 traders that are, whether they're focused on different sectors or different styles of stocks. A lot of those traders, I know because I've been there, they get so pulled in to the daily work of of servicing their their portfolio managers or doing things or responding to orders, they're missing what's going on throughout the day. And mm -hmm. so for institutional clients, I'll also provide intraday update, just pointing things out. So it's instantly just going to pop up. You know, they, they know what charts are coming, you know what colors symbolize what, and it's going to instantly tell them, this is what's going on. I'm keeping this on my screen, number one, if, so I know what's going on, number two. So if my boss comes and asks me what's going on, right, I know as well. And that's just one example of it. But I think, you know, again, being on the other side of it, if you're in this, in a service role, dealing with phones ringing, things buzzing, putting out fires all day long, you're going to miss the simple things that you see recapped on CNBC at nighttime sometimes. And that's why I try to get that information to everyone, you know, before the market opens and also you know, on the weekend as well, looking at things from a zoomed out point of view to get everyone ready for the next training week. Okay. Wow. All right. So a wealth of knowledge to say the least, like literally an encyclopedia. And it's well said too, very well articulated. You explained everything so I can understand and I'm I'm ignorant to the topic. <laughs> right? It's like it's like, all right, I, I I know a few things and that's where I keep my money. I do not know stock market S P five hundred, so I don't put any money there. But that's the position I'm in in life. Maybe one day when I'm one of your clients worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, I'll be like, hey, Frank, can you uh, you know, do this for me, please? And you'll be like, oh, sure, Chris, not a problem. And then and then I'll say that I'm in the stock market. How does that sound? I'll say, where have you been? Yeah, <laughs> where have you been? I'm trying to get there. You know, that's where <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's where I've been. So check it out. If people are interested in connecting with you or you know looking at your work or any of your products or services that you do offer, uh, Frank, where would they go to to find this? Well, the easiest place is just going to the website, which is capthesis.com. It's C-A-P-P, -P, then T-H-E-S-I-S.com. And then mentioned before that I'm active on a number of the social media platforms, X, just my name there. And then on YouTube, starting to get more active there. That's Cap Thesis and also Cap Thesis on Instagram and um, LinkedIn, of course, as well. Uh, we'll make sure we have all those links in the, in the show notes for everybody who's listening. I honestly think that you educated the hell out of me and hopefully everybody agrees with me that's listening. So Frank, you did, you did a fantastic job and we very much appreciate your time on this fine Thursday afternoon. Frank, thank you for taking me to school. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Can't wait to do it again. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So let's, let's get ready to close this out. But before we close this out, I'm going to ask you one last question. Okay. I'm going to say, if you had to give one piece of financial advice to a wannabe investor who hasn't started yet, but is right on that line, 
They haven't hired Frank, which they should. They haven't gotten into his his newsletters or he's not not into his groups yet, but they're like right on the edge to, to get into it. What would you tell them, Frank? I would say put up an account first and try to automate things as much as possible so you don't think about it. Now, again, I'm talking to someone who just wants to be a long-term investor. Whether they end up being a short-term trader after that or get an active interest in it, if you're not in the game, if you don't have skin in the game, even if it's a passive amount, they're always going to be looking at from the outside in and wishing that you were. Got it. Okay. I like it. Get started. Let's get started. The polarity there to everything is just ridiculous, right? I mean, it's it's the same advice that I would give an entrepreneur or, or excuse me, that someone that wants to become an entrepreneur who isn't, you know, but I, I really want to really want to do it. You've been telling me that for five months now. Are you going to do it or are you going to open that LLC and file for that EIN and open a business banking account um, and a credit card processor or what? What are we doing here? I respect that. Frank, you're a good man, dude. Thank you. And um, why don't we do a take two down the road? What do you think? I'm in. In the time and date, I'm right there. All right, Frank. Well, I'll catch you next time, okay? Thanks so much, Chris. My pleasure.